the truth, and nothing but the truth. This is GBN, the Gospel Broadcasting Network. Amen, we shall rise on that resurrection morning when death's prison bars are broken. We shall rise. We shall rise. Hello and welcome again to Counterpoint. I'm Mike Hickson and I have with me today, as always, B.J. Clark. B.J., so good to be with you. I enjoy it, Mike. B.J., today we want to discuss the subject, the existence of God. And it's hard to believe that there are a lot of people in the world today, in America, that make the emphatic claim, there is no God. How do you counter the atheist who says there is no God? If any of them were watching this program, and I would say this lovingly, but uh, firmly and respectfully, uh, just look at the television that you're watching right now and ask yourself whether you would ever believe in a million years that the component parts that make up your television could, given enough time and given the right explosion, just go up into the air and somehow coalesce together and form a television with all of its electronic parts and component parts and that somehow magically the airwaves could receive the signal and you know send the signal the television could receive the signal and look what people are watching right now is proof of a designer of yes, that particular television <laughs> even if you have a not a high definition television. The bottom line is every television had to have a maker. a maker. What about the men that made those televisions? Did they have a maker? They're even more sophisticated than the television is. As sophisticated as televisions are, mm -hmm. they don't have the brain power and all the uh, things that God put in us. And so it's not reasonable to deny what plain scripture affirms. Every house is built by some man. Every television is put together by some man, we might say, in more modern circumstances. But he that built all things is God. And so if one believes that everything else around them had to have a maker and a builder, why would they suddenly decide that God didn't exist and build at all? You talk about the design argument, and you mentioned the maker of the television set. I can't help but think about the psalmist when he talked about man and he said that we have been fearfully and wonderfully made. Well, the question, who made us? God did. Mm -hmm. Genesis chapter 1 is the only logical explanation for the creation of the world and man. And yet, as you noted a moment ago, there are a lot of people that have bought into this idea that we are the products of chance and explosion, whatever, that we are the products of evolution. Let, let me just read for you a quotation uh, th there's an interesting book, and I've got a copy of it in my library. I suspect you probably have one too, Bertrand Russell. And he was uh, very militant in his stance mm -hmm. against God. And he wrote a book entitled, Why I Am Not a Christian. And that title struck me years ago, still strikes me. And he said that since the time of Darwin, we understand much better why living creatures are adapted to their environment. It is not that their environment was made to be suitable to them, but that they grew to be suitable to it, and that is the basis of adaption, survival of the fittest. And so he says, there is no evidence of design about it. Now, I don't know what he was thinking when he wrote that, yeah. but, but when I look around in the world, the, the handiwork of God's creation, I see evidence for design everywhere. Have, have I missed something, B.J., no, or how I, do you counter that? I mean, you know, I, the evidence that's put forth for evolution is often misunderstood. We're not suggesting there haven't been changes within the species, but what we're suggesting is that no species has evolved into a different that's right. species. That's right. Uh, you don't, if, if they have, for example, if you ask some of the uh, evolutionists, where did the whale come from? I read at least one individual who explained it this way, cows they evolved over time into whales. Now, I'm not trying to be silly, but I am trying to 
uh, examine this thing. So am I to understand from this that one day a cow, which they don't tell us exactly where it came from, well, they could trace it back to this, something else, but where did that come from, et cetera, et cetera. But let's just start with the cow. The cow's on land and it looks out in the water and says, I wonder what it would be like to live out there instead of where I'm living here. So the cow, she wanders out into the water. She doesn't make it very long because she's not made to breathe in water and uh, she dies. But another cow sees this and I could last longer than that. The cow goes out, treads water longer than the first cow, but still dies, not fit to survive. But then there's a cow, finally one day, allegedly, that goes out into the water and treads water long enough to develop a breathing apparatus. And this cow, she's fit to survive, whereas the other cows were not. And this cow just keeps growing and growing and growing and evolving and evolving and evolving until she becomes a whale. Now that sounds like something you'd read to your child at night in a bedtime story Fictitious. that's you know right out of fantasy land. The truth is, if that really did happen, we should find fossils all over this world that are half cow, half whale, 75% cow, 25% whale, 75% whale, only 25% cow left. Where are all the transitional fossils? They do not exist. That's right. And they say, well, oh yes, they exist. No, they do not exist. And if they exist, someone says, well, I've seen them. You know what the, a lot of people have seen, Mike? They've seen drawings that people drew finding one fragment of something. It would be tantamount to finding a sliver of a hubcap in a field. And from that one sliver of the hubcap, drawing the car, drawing the uh, interior, what color was the interior, what color was the exterior, did it have a, a CD player in it, did it, how can you tell all of that from one sliver of a hubcap that you find in a field? They find one sliver of a fossil and their imaginations run wild and they start drawing all these pictures and because they can draw well, people say, oh, that, that must be true. Must be true. I, I read many years ago, Carl Sagan, who was an atheist and is now deceased, he talked about the probability of evolution. And, and of course, here is an avowed atheist. I mean, he has no reason to, to skew what he, what he thinks. But he said, you know, the probability of evolution being a reality, uh, the, the chances of that statistically are very minute. Mm -hmm. Well, he was honest in that respect. Right. The, the bottom line is it's false to the core. And, and there are any number of arguments that could be employed. The design argument, I think, is a fantastic argument. Uh, the first law <coughs> of thermodynamics, matter cannot be created nor can it be disposed of. Well, who created it? There had to be a creator right. for it to be here. Somebody had to create it. Right. It, it, it didn't just originate by chance. Well, who did that? God did. Right. It, Psalm 19 is a declaration. It is a silent sermon that continues to prevail all across this world. The heavens declare the glory of God. The firmament shows His handiwork. So, so B.J., how do we counter those who are so belligerent yeah. In, in their thinking towards Christianity and those of us who believe in God, how do we counter their claims? Because, you know, a lot of, a lot of people, quite frankly, because so-and-so has three letters beside his name, he's got to be intelligent. He's got to know what he's talking about. And I think about our young people who are in classrooms all across this country. They're in arenas where they're, they're to be academically trained, and they're being taught from start to beginning, you know what? There is no God. You're not the product of God. Right. Uh, we have to appeal to, to common sense in part because, I mean, think about this for just a moment. I'm being told that that which had no ability to think, that which had no ability to move, dead inanimate matter, suddenly kaboomed into a state of being able to think and move and speak and talk and et cetera, et cetera. This, this makes no sense whatsoever. Someone says, well, you've got to start with something or someone. I agree. 
I'd rather start with someone who had intelligence, mm -hmm. who possessed intelligence. Does that boggle my mind to think about someone always existing, never having had a beginning point? You better believe it does, which is one reason I worship him. I, was say. I worship him because I have never seen anything like this or known of anyone like him. If he has always been, then he deserves my worship. But someone says, well, you really believe where did, you know, where did God come from? They want to know. Well, where did matter come from? Where did dead inanimate matter? You you have to start with one of the two. That's right. That's right. And it makes more sense to start with the one that could think and move and talk and speak, et cetera, than to start with an inanimate, inanimate nothingness. Okay. So the old argument that's been posed for many, many years, what came first, the chicken or the egg? Right. You know, you know, there are some, you know, I think sometimes it's amazing how we use logic in every realm of life. And then when we come to spiritual matters, mm -hmm. this idea of God, His existence, we just immediately throw <clears throat> everything to the curb. And, and yet, you mentioned a moment ago the television set. What a great example of design. The home right. you live in. Did, did it just appear one day? Did, did you come home from school one day and boom, there's a home there? And think about it. Has the television set evolved over time as far as the style, the abilities, the things that, you know, we've come a long ways from the, what the original television sets look like to what they look like now, but they've always still been television sets. That's right. <clears throat> they've not been basketballs. You know, when looks at, I say, oh, look, there's a basketball. No, it's a TV. That's right. Well, it looks different than the TVs used to look. Well, sure it does. And there's some changes that take place within a species. That's right. Dogs and breeding dogs and different things, but they're still just canines. They're dogs. That's right. And what the evolutionist needs is not for change within a species. Mm -hmm. They need for there to be change that jumps across from one species to another. That, that, that's right. You don't have a dog man. No. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 11, there's a principle set forth that has stood the test of time. Every seed brings forth after its own kind. And so that's what we're talking about here. Exactly right. And, you know, if you, th if you think about it, um, some people are even trying to get us to believe that God did make the world, but He used evolutionary processes to do it. And they'll even appeal to Genesis 1 and say, well, the days there, you know, they might not be ordinary days. They might be like uh, long epochs of time, each one equally millions of years in length. Okay, let's think about that for just a moment. Um, is God not capable of creating the world in six 24-hour days if He wants to? Do you not believe that your God's powerful enough? You know what? I don't think he needed that long. I don't either. He didn't need six 24-hour days. Well, why did he do it over six 24-hour days and rest the seventh? That's for you and me. He created the work week uh, when he did that. And Genesis 1.14 has to be addressed when it comes to this days being millions and millions and millions and millions of years, allegedly. In Genesis 1.14, let, them be, let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night. Let them be for signs, for seasons, for days. Now remember, days, we're told, doesn't mean days in Genesis 1. It means millions and millions and millions and millions of years. Then what, pray tell, would and years equal in Genesis 1.14? Good question. Or maybe there's an answer to this. Maybe we take this at face value and so. believe, you know what, God's powerful enough to do it in six 24-hour days and rest the seventh. And then here's your inspired commentary, Exodus 20 and verse 11. For in six days the Lord made heaven, the earth, the sea, and all that in them is. I believe that. I, I don't apologize for believing that. And, and don't you think, B.J., that Psalm 33 is a commentary on the power of God when the psalmist said, by the word of the Lord, the heavens were made, all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. In verse 9 he said, for he spoke and it was done. He commanded, it stood fast. How did God, how did God make, the wor make the world? He spoke it into existence. And what is it, verse 8 of that passage, what does it show our, the reaction to that kind of person would be? He said, let all the earth 
fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of Him. That ought to be our response <laughs> to a divine Creator. As you said, I can't wrap my mind around a, a God that has always existed, but I know this, He deserves my attention, my respect, my awe. Right. And, 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 and no wonder the psalmist said, Oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker. Right. Ought to his, tell us something. His creative power is one of the greatest motivations to worship Him, which, by the way, Mike, very interesting to read the quotations of several atheists and uh, believers in evolution who admit, as you were noting earlier, Evolution is unthinkable, one of them said. It's clearly incredible. He said, we choose to believe it because the only alternative is special creation, and that is unthinkable, he said. Oh, wait a minute. You're admitting that there's no evidence for evolution, and the only reason you really believe it is because it keeps you in charge instead of a creator being in charge of you. So, so really, when, when you boil it all down, the, the whole idea is, I don't want to be governed right. by anyone. Mm -hmm. As I can't help but think about what Paul said in Romans chapter 1, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. Only a fool would reject the evidence before him or her. Right. And as someone says, but you're a fool for rejecting the scientific evidence of the age of the earth. Well, let's think about that for just a moment. How do we know the age of the earth is as old as they claim it is? They say, well, we know by the fossil record. We can look at the sediments and the strata, and anything found in this sediment is going to be this many millions of years old. How do you know that anything found in this strata is going to be millions of years old? Well, because of the fossil we found in it. Okay, well, how do you know the fossil is that old? I'm not making this up. Well, we know the fossil is that old because of the strata we found it in. I thought you said you knew the strata was that old by the fossil you found it. That's right. And the fossil you know is that old how? Well, because of the strata we found. They're using one assumption to prove another, which you cannot do. That's right. And you know, here's what the eureka moment for me as far as the age of the earth years ago. I don't know why I never thought of this. I remember a preacher brought it to my attention. And I thought, well, of course. There's your answer. When God created Adam, did He create him as a helpless little baby who needed a mama to nurse him into uh, his adolescent years. He created him as a full-grown, mature individual, correct? As an adult. So, seven days after God made Adam, how old would he have been technically? Seven days old. Ten days after God made Adam, how old was he? Well, he was ten days old. Have you ever seen a ten-day-old that looked like a grown man? So, wait a minute. God built the appearance of age into Adam from the get-go? Yes. So, he appeared to be older than he actually was. That's right. So, if God could do that to man, could He do it to the universe upon which man lives? So, they can throw out any age they want to throw out That's and right. say, well, the earth is this, and I'll say this, well, it may appear to be that old to you, but, but actually, just as Adam, five days after he was created, was only five days old, That's he right. appeared to be a lot older than that. And the same thing is true of the universe. So, does that say something about the omniscience of God, His knowledge, and the omnipotence of God, His power? Exactly right. He, he has the ability to do that. Look, if He could speak the world into existence, and He did, then surely He could bring it forth in maturity, right. which, which, which He did. B, BJ, I know that there are, on the one hand, atheists who say there is no God, and mm -hmm. then you have the agnostic who says, well, you know, I really can't say there is. I can't, I can't really say that there isn't a God. So, how do you counter the agnostic claim? I would say that if they'd go back and look at the evidence, <clears throat> they could come to a conclusion because Romans chapter 1 says, the invisible things of Him are clearly seen. And he goes so far as to say, that they are without excuse. There is really no excuse there in Romans chapter 1. It uh, talks about this in verse 20. The invisible things of Him from the creation of the world are clearly seen. They're not hard to find. Being understood by the things that are made, even His eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. There is no reason for one to reject uh, the 
God of heaven mm -hmm. as existing unless he just doesn't want to have a God over him. Uh, he, he needs to be willing to go by the evidence. And you know, they, they claim we don't have any evidence, we don't have any evidence. And yet I say to them, okay, you say your fossil records and your dating methods are 100% solid. Okay, tell me this. Why did they find a Civil War army button in a strata that you say is reserved for things that are millions of years old? Why did they find a modern day fishing rod and reel in a strata or sediment that you say is reserved for things that are millions and millions of years old? Maybe your methods are not as accurate as you claim. Great point. Maybe God did exactly what He said He did in the way He said He did it. That's right. And maybe because He is that powerful, you and I ought to bow down before Him and worship Him. I think that's a great observation. B.J., in, in discussing the existence of God, we can't discard the Bible. No. I understand that creation is a manifestation of deity. Revelation, also a manifestation of deity. And there are many in the world today that will castigate the Word of God. And they'll say it's a book of myth, it's fictitious. Well, how do you count all those claims because they're so abundant? Doesn't the Bible have a right to testify on its own behalf the same way I would have a right to testify on my own behalf if my integrity were being questioned? I would think so. And so if, if you're working in a laboratory and you want to know what a certain solution is, you have to test that solution to be able to identify that solution. What are its properties? Mm -hmm. And once you've looked uh, at those properties, then you can identify what it is. The Bible, does it not have a right to be tested in the laboratory of learning to see whether it does measure up to the claims that it makes? And Mike, this book right here, it's no ordinary book. And if we could just get people to slow down long enough to read passages like Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 22, which says, God sits upon the circle of the earth. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Isaiah, at the time you're living, six, seven hundred years before Christ, people don't believe, generally speaking, that the earth is a circle, a sphere. That's right. They think it's flat. How do you know that it's a circle? Did you uh, log on to NASA.gov and say, oh, now I see a picture of it? And I know that the earth is spherical. There's only one way in Isaiah's time he could have known that information, and that is if the God who made that earth in that shape revealed it to Isaiah. You're right. You're right. What, what about, since you bring that passage up, what about Job 26, verse 7? Yeah. When, when Job said, and Job, if my understanding is correct, lived during the days of the patriarchs. Yes. So he would have preceded Isaiah, Isaiah writing some seven centuries before Jesus. And so, so you know, we, we talk about the patriarchs. Abraham lived 4,000 years ago, about 2000 BC. So here's Job, and he said, he stretches out the north over empty space. And that is a scientific fact. Right. He hangs the earth on nothing. Now, many of us have seen the pictures of, of you know, Atlas carrying the globe mm -hmm. on its back. Well, you mentioned uh, logging on to NASA.gov. <laughs> Job didn't have that opportunity. No. And, and yet, how did he know, how did he know thousands of years ago that God hangs the earth on nothing? There's no way he could have known <laughs> without divine revelation. He didn't have a modern day telescope. He didn't have a spaceship. Could, he didn't have a spaceship. So there's only, only one way he could have known that. And then you think about Amos and, uh, and also Solomon both talking about the water cycle. Uh, Solomon puts it this way uh, in chapter 1, 7 of Ecclesiastes, all the rivers run into the sea, yet the sea is not full. To the place from whence the rivers come, thither they return. And in Amos chapter 9 and verse 6, uh, this is further discussed by Amos. And these are men who lived, again, centuries, centuries in advance of, you know, what modern day science would claim or the moment when these things were discovered. And how do they know the things that they're saying? Uh, for example, here's Amos 9 and, and verse number 6. It says, uh, 
He calls for the waters of the sea and pours them out upon the face of the earth. The hydrologic cycle right. depicts water coming from above, but then it condenses, evaporates, goes back up, comes back down, goes back up. Who created that hydrologic cycle? God did. And how did Amos know about it at a time when it was not generally known? Tremendous point. Since you bring up water, we've got two and a half minutes left. What about the psalmist David? When, when he talks about the greatness of God and how worthy He is of our, of our praise and adoration in Psalm 8 when He said, The birds of the air, the fish of the sea that pass through the paths of the sea. How did David know anything about oceanography? Right. And there was a man by the name of Matthew Fontaine Morey. That did. The founder of uh, modern day oceanography. And this passage right here sent uh, him on a quest to find the paths of the seas, lo and behold, he, he found, found them. He did. The, the jet stream that we see on the weather every night, Solomon talks about it in Ecclesiastes 1. Uh, these are not coincidences. Anomalies, not at all. These are because these men were, as Peter put it, holy men of God who spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. That's right. This information came from God. No other way. No other way. B.J., it, it might be that we have people watching this program. They believe Jesus to be the Son of God. John said in John chapter 8, quoting Jesus, except you believe that I'm He, you'll die in your sins. What would a person need to do to become a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ in the sense that that believer is a child of God, a Christian? Right. You read the book of John and faith is produced by what you read. And then what do you do with that faith? You repent because God's commanded all men everywhere to do that. Acts 17, 30. And then you confess. Uh, and that's not something that you're reluctant to do. You, so every knee will someday bow and every tongue will someday confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Philippians 2, 9 to 11. And what does a penitent confessing believer do in the New Testament as this next step? He is baptized then into Christ uh, to put on Christ, Galatians 3, 27. Uh, and then to live for Christ uh, to be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, and His labor won't be in vain in the Lord. Uh, that's the method of salvation in the New Testament. We can't improve on it. You're so true. B.J., always, always great to be with you. Appreciate what you've said. Thank you for being a part of our program. We hope what we have said today has benefited you. Look forward to seeing you right back here next week. God bless. We shall rise on that resurrection morning when death's prison bars are broken. We shall rise. We shall rise. Gospel Broadcasting Network offers a free non-denominational Bible course. It's based strictly on God's Word and not the creeds or traditions of men. Why not contact us for lesson number one? Walking in sunlight, sunlight of love, heavenly sunlight, heavenly sunlight. You may want to enroll by email. The address is info at gbntv.org. To enroll by phone, call us toll free at 888-888. 805-3390. This has been a presentation of the Gospel Broadcasting Network.